We will attack the center. But I think you are right about the flank, General. What I will do is give you two other divisions, General Pettigrew and General Tremble. They are stronger and more rested. So now you will have nearly three divisions at your command, including General Pickett. Your objective will be that clump of trees yonder. The attack will be preceded by massed artillery. We'll concentrate all of our guns on that one small area. When the artillery has had its effect, your charge will break the line. You will have nearly 15,000 men at your command, General. And you may begin whenever you're ready. But plan it well. Do plan it well, I pray you, sir. We stake everything on this. Sir. team begins, I've wanted to begin making videos that cover a wide range of time periods that I and many other people are interested in, because there are a lot of wars and conflicts spanning human history that have funny and interesting aspects to them. Today I'm going to be looking at two battles in the American Civil War, and plan to continue to branch out in the future. If you are a fan of wars going even further back, back to say the time of the Vikings, you may be interested in today's sponsor, the free-to-play browser strategy game Vikings War of Clans, where you become a Viking chief and get to command a village of your own. You can build up your armies and improve your technology so that you can defeat all your foes. I've really been liking the very decently sized map the game features as a play area, giving you lots of space to expand your village. The immersive strategy style is rewarding and user-friendly, and it begins you playing very quickly. More people are actually playing this game than the total number of Vikings that actually lived. So come join us and help the channel by clicking the link in the description to get a bonus of 200 gold coins and the novice's relocation item as a kickstart. The American Civil War was an incredibly pivotal point in the history of the United States. And the mention of it, for history enthusiasts, immediately brings to mind images of large battlefields with long lines of men dressed in blue and gray, fighting with outdated tactics and modern weapons. The results of which being very large casualty figures by each engagement's end. The deadliest of these almost always involves some form of assault or charge of an enemy position to force them off the field. And there are two really big ones that people seem to come back to time and time again. The most famous of the two is the attack on Cemetery Ridge on the final day of the Battle of Gettysburg, commonly referred to as Pickett's Charge. The lesser known one, although I guess that depends on where you come from and which side you like making fun of more, is the attack on Maury's Heights within the Battle of Fredericksburg. Both of these actions have been heavily criticized since they took place, and often lead to a discussion as to which one was the poorer choice. First, let's look at Fredericksburg. Fighting at Fredericksburg was an idea that Northern commanders had been kicking around for a while, even before the eventual ill-fated commander of the Union forces, and man who gave up shaving halfway through, General Ambrose Burnside, became the commander of the Army of the Potomac. His predecessor, an example of caution is a bad trait, George McClellan, had kicked the idea of what the battle eventually became around in his head for a while before being relieved of command, going as far as requesting pontoon boats for the required crossing of the Rappahannock River. Although the plan as we know it wasn't made up by McClellan, it was there enough to be inherited by Burnside who pursued its eventual execution, originally with pushback from Lincoln, who came around to the idea closer to the execution date in December of 1862. Fredericksburg was a target because it's pretty much exactly between Washington and Richmond, the capital of the Confederate States of America. The Battle of Fredericksburg was to be the springboard from which an attack on Richmond would take place that would first attempt to bypass Lee's army and end the war in a quick decisive move. It looked like this would be possible at the beginning with only 10,000 Confederate troops in the city and Lee's army about two days behind. However, the pontoon boats and engineers needed arrived extremely late, and in the days that it took them to get there, Lee's army was able to arrive, set up defensive positions in the city, and entrench in the bluffs just outside of it, daring the Army of the Potomac to come get them. After a very rough fight taking the city, first crossing the river in pontoon boats under fire, Burnside was then met with the challenge of attacking the convex Confederate line on the heights just beyond the city, and decided that a two-prong attack, one on the southern end towards Jackson and one on the northern end towards Longstreet, would be the best move. This is the aspect of Fredericksburg that no one seems to talk about. That the fighting on Marius Heights that everyone remembers is just half the battle. But because Marius Heights has such disproportionate casualty figures, and on the surface level seems so futile, it's what's talked about. But with 6,000 to 8,000 northern soldiers lost to the South Smear 1200, how could a supporting attack be so catastrophic? In short, it was a poorly coordinated move against a very strong position. Here's a quick representation I've set up using some old childhood toys. The southern troops were well protected behind a stone wall supported by artillery on higher ground behind them as wave after wave of federal troops pressed towards them. 
There were a total of seven attacks on Mari's Heights during the fighting, and the large number of these is due to poor coordination with Union forces fighting on the southern flank. The first attack was ordered after hearing cannon fire coming from the southern end of the line, thinking that it was Meade's troops moving forward, but in reality it was just preemptive Confederate gunfire. Attacks 2 through 4 were in support of the actual attack on the southern front, and the withdrawal of the troops there once it failed. So what were attacks 5 through 7 then? If the main attacks have stopped, surely the support action can as well. Well, unfortunately for the Union troops, one of the features of the battlefield at Mari's Heights is, for lack of a better term, a ditch with a small river in it with trees growing on either side of the bank that Federal forces had to break formation, cross on footbridges, and then reform on the other side of to continue their attack. During the previous attacks of the support action, it had created a huge traffic jam of troops separated from their units and completely disorganized. Burnside, fearing Lee's legendary aggressiveness, felt that a Confederate counterattack was imminent the minute his attack stopped, and in the chaotic state that his army was in, they would be steamrolled. He was forced to make a very difficult decision that he's been criticized for ever since, to throw all of his reserves into three more attacks to buy the army time to reorganize and withdraw. Now, I'm not here to argue that the attack on Mari's Heights was a good idea. You're just asking for trouble attacking a position like this in general. But knowing about the southern flank and the need to cover the retreat really does change how you view it. That it was not something ordered thoughtlessly that was bad and turned out bad. You should feel bad. But a plan that did actually have some sense to it. It was the piling on of so many other factors, the delays in the pontoons, the Confederates digging in, and the problematic topography in the field that turned a risky move with some hope to its success into an utter disaster, which is often the pass given to our second battle of interest, Pickett's Charge, an attack much less deserving of this kind of forgiveness. Pickett's Charge is the capping off of the three-day-long Battle of Gettysburg and the end of the ill-fated Confederate invasion of the North. Confederate General Robert E. Lee commenced this move for a variety of reasons, the wisdom of which has been debated over ever since. After dancing around Pennsylvania with the Union Army for a few months, the two clashed at Gettysburg after some Union cavalry successfully baited elements of Lee's army into a fight that quickly escalated into the large confrontation that Lee had been waiting for. It started out as a minor scrap with a few militia, the next thing I know I'm, I'm tangled with half the Union Army. Day one saw the Confederates doing well, taking the town, but failing to take the high ground beyond that that the Union forces entrenched in over the night. Day two ended with failed attacks on the flanks of the Union line, and on day three, as General Pickett's troops of Longstreet's Corps made it to the battlefield, Lee saw what was, in his mind, a golden opportunity. He figured that since the day previous they had hit the Union flanks, that that's where all of their reserves would be stationed, expecting him to try similar attacks again. Because of this, the center of the Union line would be weak, and a large attack at Cemetery Ridge could break the line and win him the battle. His plan involved a large artillery barrage to soften up the Union forces who would be mopped up by Longstreet's men after crossing about a mile of open field. And I give credit where credit is due. If things had worked out like they did in Lee's head, this might have been possible. If the artillery was able to do its job and not have the limited ammunition stores that it did, and the Union reinforcements were unable to have been brought up, the weight of the attack might have broken the line, but this was a huge gamble and had way more variables than a lot of Lee's underlings were comfortable with. General Longstreet, for example, felt that the attack was going to be such a failure that he was not able to give the order and simply nodded when Pickett told him that he was about to move forward and commence the attack. And unfortunately for the men involved, he was completely right. Confederate forces walked into a death trap with overlapping fields of fire, cutting men down at incredible rates. Union soldiers made great use of a stone wall for protection, just like the Confederates had previously at Fredericksburg, when cutting down southern troops. By some miracle, a handful of the attackers reached the stone wall at the Union's line, but before long, the force was in full retreat and left Gettysburg utterly shattered. With how poorly the whole thing went, you have to wonder why Lee ordered such a risky maneuver. I mean, this is the guy that had won victory after victory leading up to this. It seems out of character for him to commit his men to something that looks like it's doomed to fail and relies on so many things to go his way to have any chance of success. So why did he order it? Well, I think this quote from General Lee right after the Battle of Chancellorsville gives us a very good look into his thought process. At Chancellorsville, we gained another victory. Our people were wild with delight. I, on the contrary, was more depressed than after Fredericksburg. Our losses were severe, and again, we had gained not an inch of ground, and the enemy could not be pursued. Lee was very aware of his army's position and the economics of the country he was fighting for. He knew that the industrial and manpower resources of the North were far greater than that of the South. 
and he was well aware that the North could replace their losses at almost infinitum, whereas he was not going to get very much, if anything, from the much smaller population of the South. Because of this, a victory in the traditional sense was not really a victory, because even if the battle ended in a Union retreat, with the Confederate Army taking fairly few losses, when they met again, Union losses would be replenished, whereas he would still be carrying the burden of the losses he had suffered previously at their hands. So to him, the only victory that mattered, or that was worth celebrating, was one where the enemy was utterly beaten and could not return to fight another day. The longer the war went, the worse a position he would be in as his army slowly whittled away. Knowing this, put yourself in Lee's shoes. He has just fought for two days, taking casualties, and the enemy is still on the field. He can do one of two things. Withdraw, having taken losses he can't afford, gaining nothing in return, or he can attack, and even though it's under less than ideal conditions, believe in the strength of his men and hopefully destroy the Union Army and win the victory he's been chasing since the war began. And he chose the latter for the exact reason stated earlier. He had to win the decisive victory and he couldn't lose men for two days and just accept it because those losses were not going to be recouped. And this was obviously the bad choice because all he ends up doing is losing even more men and not even coming close to winning the victory that he needs, but this mentality towards the situation that he has really explains why he comes to this conclusion and does what he does. But even with all this being said about both leaders and their reasoning, I do not think it's fair to assert that Fredericksburg and Gettysburg are the same sort of blunder. Both of them were for sure bad ideas, and the commanders that ordered them definitely made poor choices informed too much by their hopes of how they would turn out, and not enough on the reality of what probably would, but many people wrongly see these battles as two sides of the same coin. Gettysburg and Fredericksburg are a false equivalency for the simple reason that Lee had the opportunity to learn from Burnside's mistakes, and not only refused to, but made the same one with fewer acceptable reasons to do so. After watching the Union commit to a move that basically guaranteed high casualties, he should have filed that lesson away as something never to do with his army. An army that could not under any circumstances take high casualties like that, a reality that he himself admits. But after being given this free first-hand lesson to moves not to make 101 don't attack a stone wall with entrenched troops behind it, his thought process becomes clouded by a driving obsession for a decisive victory that he wants so badly. And Lee makes the very ironic blunder of losing a lot of troops in an action that is trying to give meaning to the previous two days of troop loss. And after the clear sign from the universe that is given to him at Fredericksburg, no amount of faith in his troops' fighting ability or belief in the details working out in his favor can justify such a bad tactical move, even when compared to the extremely similar one made by the human army in the months prior. I would like to thank my patrons on Patreon for making this possible. They've been suggesting different time periods to explore in videos for a while now, and it's been really fun to see their reactions and their input. As always, thank you to everyone for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.